Hello, wildlings. I'm your creep smith, and you found my fear forge. <laughs> Lucky you. Obsessed. Compelled. Batshit insane. These are descriptors applied to people you don't want to accept invitations from. Especially invitations to an isolated facility of unknown nature situated where no one will ever look. Nevertheless, there would be no last installment of tonight's story had no one accepted. Our final episode, to my old fourth grade classmates in Mrs. Barther's biology class, Lock Your Doors, by Bad Fake Smiles. Beans and Things. It was the name of the coffee shop that Emily and I agreed to meet up at. I did some frantic scrolling on her Facebook to check out what she looked like. I kind of felt like a creep or a stalker, but you have to understand that it had been 16 long years since I had last seen any of my classmates. As for me, I'll probably be easy to spot once I entered the shop since I was the only Asian kid in class. I was feeling all sorts of emotions when I did enter the shop. The smell of roasted beans surprised my nose and made it itch a little. My hands were sweating and my legs were jelly because I really wanted to bail. Partly since I wanted absolutely no part in this crazy teacher's narrative anymore, but also because I was getting kind of insecure. I constantly pulled out my phone to fix my hair and made sure my sleeves were rolled up evenly. I scanned the room for a girl with black hair, wearing a turtleneck and beanie. There were a lot of them. I wish I had asked for the color. Nats! A girl from the farthest corner of the room called out and waved at me. She was wearing a pink turtleneck and a purple beanie. I nervously smiled as I walked towards the table. We shook hands and sat down, waiting for the first person to start saying, well, anything. It's, uh, been a long time. I awkwardly tried to break the ice. She simply took a deep breath. Yeah, it has. She gave me the warmest smile after. So, um, uh, you want anything? I asked. Oh, no, her eyes lit up. It's okay. Uh, August got us some coffee. My eyebrows wrinkled upon hearing his name. Wait, August is here? Yeah. So I shook my head in disappointment. That was something that she should have said before I agreed to go. I grabbed my phone and got up from my chair to leave, but her cold hands grabbed mine and stopped me. No, wait. Uh, look, I know it's hard to be here with your ex-bully. Her concerned face turned into a smirk. Slash ex, she raised a brow. But he contacted me first about it, and I just think there's safety in numbers. I breathed in through my teeth, and before I could reply, a familiar voice interrupted, headed to our table. Sup, Nats? August was wearing the same old denim jacket and wearing the same lame-ass cologne. He sat down with three cups of coffee on a black tray, seemingly unbothered. I was unbothered too, or was at least trying to act like it. I pulled my hand from Emily's and sat back down, fidgeting with my phone. I was looking down, turning it on and off, but I could see with my peripheral that he was indeed looking at me. August took a deep breath. So, uh... Nats, how's it going? Why are we even going? I interrupted. This teacher fucked us up in just a year. She's a creepy old hag. My voice was sounding more agitated. What that disgusting woman had done to me back in the hospital came rushing back again. Emily had a more soothing tone. Kind of sounded like one of those ASMR videos you'd listen to. She answered the question by turning it back to me. You said yourself, she's dying and she's just an old woman. This was ridiculous. Lots of past teachers are already dead. Some of them were also dying. I demanded an answer to why the hell we needed to fulfill this old hag's wish. 
I clenched my fist from my blood boiling. Money, August replied. That was the initial pitch I gave to Emily, and she came up with this altruistic stuff soon after. Seriously? Emily's sweet voice changed. A woman who was seemingly obsessed, no, was obsessed with us, left a gift. She tracked us down, sent us letters. We're probably, like, the only family she had, August confidently explained. Plus, isn't she a famous scientist or whatever? It's probably her life savings, man. He wasn't wrong, however. Going on this little hunt did make sense. Whatever she wanted to give us was probably something valuable since she was fond of us. It was easy for them to say since they weren't groped by the b old woman. But I couldn't. I... I couldn't bring myself to regurgitate everything of what happened inside the hospital. I didn't want it buried down somewhere inside of me. I needed this distraction. I needed to know what was driving Mrs. Barther to act like this. She might not have been the best teacher, but it's the right thing to do. She's just a poor old lady. Emily reached for my hand again. August chuckled slightly as Emily gave him the side eye. The word fine found it hard to escape my lips. The next thing I knew, I was driving to our old abandoned elementary school with August and Emily. August called Shotgun, because he was always Shotgun, at least according to him. Can we change what's playing on the radio? Emily asked him from the back seat. What? Hits too close to home? August replied with a smug face. We continued the ride while listening to Highway to Hell. It was distasteful, but... But I had too much going on inside my head to be bothered too much. 9.27 p.m. It was a long drive, but we eventually managed to find the school. We parked the car just outside the rusty gates. Shining the headlights made it conjure up ominous shadows on the building's front door. The gates were chained and locked. I pulled the key from my pocket and tried it. Wasn't a fit. August pulled me back and proposed a different solution. He kicked the chains repeatedly. The noise was only slightly unbearable. Emily and I got worried someone would hear us trespassing, but he actually managed to kick the chain off, leave it to the soccer player to open old gates. After that, he looked at me and smiled as if I'd given him the pleasure of looking impressed as if I'd given him the pleasure of looking impressed. We traveled inside the dark woods with only our phones to act as flashlights. Apparently the letters contained maps behind them. I was just too busy throwing mine out to notice. Walking down the path, snapping twigs and crunching dried leaves helped me remember the time when I saw Mrs. Barther disappear inside the woods with the ice boxes of our slides. Somehow, it still sent shivers down my spine. We were walking the same steps that she had. The image of her, that happy face of hers, was flashing before my eyes as if she was just in front of us. Wait! I called to them from behind. My breathing was getting inconsistent and I could feel the trees closing in on me. I fell down to my knees and they rushed to my aid. You okay? We're almost there, Emily shouted. August pulled me back up and rubbed my back. I get them sometimes too, he whispered, usually after I wake up from a nightmare. Sometimes, even if I'm wide awake, he offered to turn back, though I dusted myself off and told them it was okay. I wanted to see it through. The cabin wasn't itself anything extraordinary. It stood in the middle of the woods, surrounded by twigs and leaves. Seeing the cabin's dark wooden exterior and dusty windows as we shined our lights on it wasn't really an inviting sight. The moon, although it shone bright, wasn't helping the overall mood either. I found myself nervous. My knees were shaking as we got closer to it. We slowly walked toward the front door when suddenly I heard rustling noises from the trees around us. No, 
I, I, I can't. I started breathing heavily. We're literally a couple steps from finding the money, Emily then disclosed. I stared at her in disbelief, although August really didn't look that surprised. Let's go! Emily got rid of her calm, sweet voice, walking head-on into the dark wooden door. August went inside after her, telling me that we needed to help her. I followed soon after, afraid of what I might see lurking in the trees. The cabin interior was just as you'd expect a crazy old hag would live in. The living room and the kitchen were seemingly blended together, having almost no space for the three of us to roam around. It had a single light bulb in charge of illuminating the whole lot, making it less like a cabin to live in, but a well-decorated tool shed instead. The carpet we were standing on was moldy and dusty, although the description fits rather well on the walls, shelves, and furniture as well. How the hell is this relic running with electricity? August asked as he flipped the light switch on and off. Would you stop it? Emily told him, visibly irritated. Take a look at this. She didn't need to point it out since it was the most noticeable thing inside the cabin. A door slightly opened with a busted padlock. We're too late, Emily grunted. I don't think so. August approached the lock and inserted the angel key. It fitted perfectly. If it was one of us, then they should have just used the key. No point in wrecking the lock or the poor door. August opened the door, and an unpleasant smell came out of it. We all took a step backwards because of how putrid it was. It smelled of rot and alcohol mixed, burning our nostrils. As we shined some light in, it appeared to be a door leading to a basement. A chain dangling from the doorway suggested that it was to light the stairway, but it didn't do anything. Well, ladies first, August smirked at Emily. With an annoyed face, Emily proceeded to descend into the darkness. You can stay here if you want to, August looked back at me. He was probably concerned, but I took it more as a challenge at the time. I walked past him and followed Emily down into the basement. It seemed like a normal one, full of trash at first, but the more we moved around, the more it started to get intriguing. Stacks of wooden boxes were scattered and piled against the walls, and the floor was made of cement, but it felt grimy and slippery. Our shoes would occasionally make squishing noises in some parts of the floor, and neither of us bothered looking at what we were actually stepping on. Old stuff in an old cabin, except for the operating table, shining clean and new in the middle of the room. We all approached the operating table and found traces of shining liquid on its surface, dripping down the sides. What the fuck is this? Escaped my mouth almost involuntarily. We continued to scan the room for anything worth bringing home. Where's the money? said Emily. She approached the wooden boxes and tried to see if she could pry them open. I continued circling the operating table and found a bag of tools underneath. Surgical saws, syringes, hooks, clamps, all of it bloodied and clumped together inside a red bag. I flinched to the sound of broken glass. Emily had clumsily broken a jar that she found inside one of the boxes. She stepped back and made gagging noises because of how badly it smelled. I went to her to check if she was okay and to inspect the boxes as well. Inside were the jars of piss Mrs. Barther had been collecting. What the hell? Why are our names on those jars? She gagged. Opening the other boxes revealed the towels and the blood slides neatly stacked together. She'd been collecting them for sure. It was a thought I'd always had, but I had never confirmed up until that moment. Of course, to Emily, everything came as a shock. She started tearing up, asking us to please leave. Emily, calm down. We need to calm down, Emily shouted. This is invasive. This is insane. This is fucking... She stopped. We both stopped and stayed silent. Creaking noises came from upstairs. 
Soon, it started getting clear that they were footsteps, but the pattern was weird. It sounded like multiple people were walking above us. What's that? Emily whispered. Probably whatever was inside this, August called our attention as he was slowly walking back from something. He shined the light at what seemed to be a large metal cage. It stood about eight feet by seven. At the bottom of the cage seemed to be lumps of brown and red substances. I couldn't stare at it long enough to figure out what they were. The bars in the middle of the cage were bent open as if something had gotten out. Holy shit, I gasped, looking at the clipboard hanging from the right side of the cage. Project Angel by Dr. Veronica S. Barther. We heard the footsteps again. August signaled us to turn off our flashlights and pulled both of us into a dark corner of the basement. Whatever it was, it cast its shadow on the basement stairs. We all looked at it in horror with hands on our mouths. It wasn't the silhouette of a person or of any animal we knew. We huddled together, cowering in fear. Then it simply left. We stood there, shaking for a good ten minutes before I turned on my phone light, deciding to speak out and ask if it was time to please get the fuck out of there. Okay, count of three. We run up the stairs and go outside, no looking back. August looked us both in the eyes. My world was spinning again, and this time I was actually ready to vomit. But the adrenaline was keeping me stable. The three of us could feel each other's bodies shaking. But we knew that it wasn't time to screw up, okay? One, two, three. All of us sprinted across the basement. The floor made it hard for us to sprint our full extent or else we would have fallen on our faces. Once we reached the living room, we all ran outside. We turned on our phones and looked straight ahead. Well, that was the plan anyway. We only made it a couple of steps outside the house when I heard August stop running. I looked back to check on him, and he was standing still, looking up. Brother! It was like a choir, the sound of children's voices in unison, screaming. It was coming from the roof of the cabin. Brother! Sister! My jaw dropped and my hand could barely keep the light shining on the thing on the roof. At first glance, it looked like a spider. A gigantic spider whose leg span was around six feet. The more you looked at it, the more you noticed its more grotesque features. In the center of those eight legs was a mass of pink and bloodied flesh shimmering from all the mucus it was covered in. It was dripping with the same viscous fluids I'd seen on the operating table. On the body were faces, multiple disfigured faces, but they weren't indistinguishable. I saw mine, I saw August's and Emily's and all of the other classmates that I could remember, our young nine-year-old faces writhing and squirming on the surface of that monstrosity. I continued shining my light as it sang with all the voices of my classmates. I was almost in a trance, frozen in fear after seeing all of their eyes looking at me. Until I felt a big tug on my shirt. Nats, let's go! August screamed at me as he pulled. My legs started working again and we ran deep into the woods as I heard the monster skitter behind us. We ran as fast as we could, Emily being several meters in front of us. Then I heard a lunge from the trees, rustling and crying. We reached the school's front gate. Emily was already holding the door to the front seat, waiting for me to open the car. I hurriedly climbed in behind the wheel as August sat in the back. They both shouted at me to hurry as they scanned for the creature outside the car. Is it gone? Emily whispered as she frantically looked around the car for any signs of the creature. Any time now, Nats. I'm trying! I shouted back at August, desperately trying to get the car started. As we were catching our breath inside the car, we heard nothing outside but silence. The creature was nowhere to be found either. When I got it running, I put the car in reverse and turned it back to where we'd come from. 
Then I stepped on the gas. We got quite a distance from the school and no creature was following us from behind, so we collectively sighed in relief. Well, August chuckled. Guess we... Something big landed on top of the car. Out of nowhere, I heard the rear windshield shatter. We were all screaming at the top of our lungs. Nets! August was screaming in pain. I looked back and saw the creature latching onto him, digging its claws into his arms, head, and chest, trying to pull him out through the rear window. August was desperately clawing at my shoulders, calling out my name. I reached out to grab him and stopped the car. Emily wasn't wearing a seatbelt, so she hit her head on the dashboard and knocked herself unconscious. I struggled to pull August back as he was slowly dragged out of the car. I turned to unbuckle my belt for a second, and just in that time, August was pulled from the back seat as if he was nothing but a rag doll. I stumbled out of the car and after them, Augie! Augie! I screamed out into the dead of night. All that was left was the trail of mucus and blood leading back to Oaks Elementary School. I fell to my knees, unable to do anything. I stared into the distance until eventually, Augie's awful screams stopped. I sat down in the middle of the road, in the middle of nowhere, dazed. The sun began to rise and I was waiting for myself to wake up, waiting for my body to start moving, to do something. Emily eventually woke up with a bloodied forehead. I heard her stumbling out of the car where she later sat down beside me and cried. It's been a week since I last stepped outside my room. I haven't slept, bathed, or eaten. There's not a day that passes by I don't blame myself for what happened to August. I also got word that Barther passed away. To my old fourth grade classmates from Mrs. Barther's biology class, I hope you burn those letters. I hope you never visit Oaks again. What I saw in that cabin is something that I will never forget until the day I die. Which I'm guessing won't be too long now. I was keeping in close contact with Emily after all of that happened. And she started to talk to me about how she could still hear the skittering from time to time. After that, she stopped answering my messages. So I guess I want to end this letter with advice to the rest of you remaining, all 27. Lock your doors, because I'm pretty sure... I'm starting to hear the skittering outside my house, too. So, if you want to adopt the doctrine of believing the best in people until they prove otherwise, more power to you. Just realize there are those times and those people that will use that belief against you. Crazy mad scientists, for instance. So stay scary, my wildlings. Go ahead and indulge creativity. But at least try to keep sanity in sight and make the most of your nights. <laughs>